And we want to welcome our congregation that are online for watching. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have what it takes. Look at your neighbor and say, I have what it takes. That's my, the title of today's message is You Have What It Takes. Look at your other neighbor and say, You Have What It Takes. Look at the person behind you and talk to the back of their head and say, You Have What It Takes. Hallelujah. I was looking in the book of Psalms 37. The Word of God says in verse 1, Do not fret because of evil doers. Do not fret because of evil doers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. How many know it's easy to look at the world, see people in the world that don't serve God, they're living for the devil, and yet they're successful? And you're like, what? <laughs> Something wrong with this, Willis? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, why well, I'm over here serving God, I'm faithful, I'm giving, I'm doing all these things, and yet why are they the ones that are su successful? Why does that person get, you know, get, have the successful business, and I'm over here serving God, doing my best, and I'm over here struggling? It's because he's on the devil's side. devil's not messing with him. That was for free. <laughs> now, I'll tell you why. I'm going to be honest with you. We can get envious of evil workers, but I'm going to tell you why they're successful. It's not because the devil's on their side. It's not because of any of that. They're successful because they applied the rules and laws that God has put forward called reaping and sowing. They've applied what they know, and they've invested in what they know with, with wisdom and, and understanding and how to work, work with their hands and work really hard. They've done that, and they became successful. And you're thinking, well, what about me? Well, I'm going to tell you that if you applied the same thing, it would be on your side too. But the difference between you as a believer and a, and a person in the world is they're doing it, but it's all their effort. They have to do everything. If you did the same application and you put your hands to the plow and you did what you knew to do, the Bible says whatever you put your hands to, you shall prosper. The difference between you and the world is God will open doors for you. It, it'll just come towards you. It'll just, goodness and mercy will follow you. Things will just happen. The opportunities will open up. The problem is, is a lot of people, they don't want to put their hands to the plow. They want to sit home, eat bonbons, sit on the couch, watch Andy Griffith and say, bless me, Lord. <laughs> Guess what? Not going to happen. I promise. You can't just sit home, do nothing, and then say, God, bless me, bless me, bless me. And God's going to say, get up, get up, get up. Go do something with your life. Go, go forward. Move forward. And that's how the kingdom works. We can't just sit home. Listen, some of us, you know, there's some people in here, maybe today or maybe online, you don't have a job. Let me, let me tell you something. You have a job. It's called eight hours a day. Go look for a job. You say, well, I look online. Let me, let me tell you something about the online stuff. I understand it, and that's a new world. That's okay. But so what? Show up anyways. Put your face in front of them and say, hi, I'm here. I want a job. Go apply online. Okay, but don't forget this face. I mean, the worst thing you want to do is end up at the, you know, at Starbucks, the hub of the unemployed. Come on, somebody. Get out there. It's okay. Put your hands to the plow. Don't be, don't be envious of evil workers. Get out there. God has, you have what it takes. And I want to encourage you, when you have the power of God, you can walk into a place and say, you're going to hire me, you want to hire me, you need to hire me. I'm going to, because of my presence in this, now don't tell them that, but you know that because of your, come on, because of your presence in that place, God will bless that company just like he did for Joseph. Come on, somebody. I mean, Joseph worked for a pharaoh. He worked for someone that wasn't godly, but yet everything that that person had was blessed because Joseph was in the house. See, when you put your hand, when you're working at those companies, man, I believe that that company can prosper just because you're there and because God wants to bless you and will bless you through that. Don't think for a second that you're not going to have the blessing of God when you put your hands to the plow. It says, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. But listen to this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. I love verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you, he shall give you the desires of his heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. Delight yourself in the Lord. Everybody say delight. Delight. Yourself in the Lord. And he, will give, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. In other words, when you say delight yourself in the Lord, you know what that really means is when the Bible says work as unto the Lord, that means you don't work as like your boss. It's not really talking about you working for your boss as he's the Lord, as he's God, and you're working for God when you go flip burgers. It's not really what he's talking about. When he says work as unto the Lord, what it really means is that when you go to work, don't think of it as I'm working so that I can pay my bills. You th- look at it as I'm working so I can invest in the kingdom. And when your, your whole view and your perspective changes towards the kingdom, God says, oh, you got my attention because you're about the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. So I'm not flipping my burger thinking I got to pay a bill with this. I'm flipping my burger saying, man, I can make some money so I can give into the offering so God, so the house can be built. And God says, oh, I'll make you a manager. You keep doing that. You keep that up. You're going to own that company pretty soon because my perspective has changed and I have a kingdom mindset. That was for somebody today because you've been asking yourself that. Then it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, when we read that scripture, we used to think that, well, you know, he gives me what I desire, but I, I see it a little bit different. It says, he shall give me the desires of my heart. In other words, God takes his desire and places it in my heart, and I desire what he desires. So he places his desire in my heart. So I'm seeking the kingdom, his desires in my heart. Therefore, I know God's going to bless it because it's his will. It's his way. It's what he wants. And it's not my desire. It's his desire placed in my heart. See, my Bible tells me, and I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible says that he knows the plans. He knows the plans that he has for me, and they're good plans, not of evil, that I may prosper. Prosper. Somebody say, Pastor, it's not about money. Oh, yeah, it could be. You know, most people that talk, say stuff like that, like, oh, oh, you know, oh, that's that, bless me. Most of those people are broke. People that complain about that usually don't have any money. That's why they say those things, because those that are blessed are like, right on. But let let, let me share something with you that's going to encourage you in this area. He gives me the the plan. He knows the plan. See, I need to know his plan for my life because if I don't know the plan, I'm just going to wander. Lord, I need to know your plan. I need to know that every footstep is ordered by the Lord. That means it's a commanding order. If I go this way, it's because he told me to go this way. You know, the other day, Heather and I, we went to these, we went to one of these, uh, big department store. I won't mention any names, but its initials are Costco. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not a Costco fan. I, I really am. I'm sorry, Costco, if you're watching. I'm a, I'm a Sam's Club person myself. Now, now, I'm not saying Costco has great stuff. I, 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 I like to buy stuff at Costco. I just don't like waiting on the lines. I, why does everybody have to go to Costco? But it's okay. You guys all keep going to Costco because I'll just keep going to Sam's Club where there's no lines. Hallelujah. I don't want to give that secret away because there's always a parking spot at Sam's Club, you know. And the last thing I'm going to do is wait in line at, and get gasoline and use up all my gas to put gas. <laughs> that was for free. So anyways, long story short, I got to cut that part off later. <laughs> so anyways, I, I went to Costco because Heather wanted to go to Costco. As soon as I walked in, the first thing I did was look at the line. Oh, that's the devil. But you know, when I was looking around at Costco and we're walking around the store, everything was cool. I went down this one aisle and I was looking at these security cameras and a, and a gentleman walked up to me and he's like, hey, uh, which camera do you think is the best? And I said, well, I was like, okay. And I, I said, uh, Hi. <laughs> 
He said, which camera do you recommend? And I said, well, I have this one, and I'm just seeing how, if I got the right, good price. And uh, he's like, oh, that's cool. So we started talking. He started talking to me. And he started saying, oh, yeah, you know, and we just started, I don't know where, how it came up. He started telling me how, you know, who he was, that he was a very high, um, how, how do you say it, how would you say it? Kind of high official, you know, flew some high, you know, went, to, flew a helicopter to the inauguration and picked up some heavy duty people, you know what I'm, that, that kind of. And it's like, what? And you're asking me about what camera I should get. And you're buying your cameras at Costco? No. <laughs> that was the first thing that went through my mind, so actually. <laughs> Discernment, no. <laughs> okay. So, 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 but, but then he goes, uh, and we're just chatting. He goes, uh, he asked me what I did. And I said, oh, I'm a pastor at the Rock Church Riverside. He goes, oh, my gosh, man, I got to give you a hug. You know, you guys are doing a great job. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> And I said, "What do you do?" And he said, "Well, I build I build uh, those those trains, those uh, the, the trolleys, like at Disneyland and 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 Jelly Belly." And and he started showing me all these pictures, of these trolleys that he builds. You, I mean, the real stuff. And I'm like, "Hi, best friend." <laughs> I didn't say that, but inside it was like, "I want one." I can get people to come to church just to ride the trolley because <laughs> they look cool. So we started chatting, real nice guy. And he goes, and out, out of the blue, he said this to me. He said, you know what I'm going to do? He goes, I like you. He said, I have a big warehouse where I have all this stuff to build all these things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to come anytime you want to this warehouse where everything's at and you can build anything you want for your church and just keep it. See, what he doesn't know is he thinks I'm just a pastor. He doesn't know that I have been touched by the Holy Spirit and I can do all things through Christ Jesus. That I'm not just a pastor. I'm not just just preach. I don't just have a church and preach. I'm creative. I know how to build. I know how to make things happen. I, I, I can do stuff. And I was like, right on. And I thought to myself, oh, my, 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 what a, that's a sermon. Hallelujah. Because I had to go into the inconvenient place. I had to go to a place where I didn't, wasn't comfortable going, a place where I did not want to go to find that the blessing was there the whole time. You see, sometimes God has plans for you. He has purpose for you. But that plan and that purpose and that walking and that talking where he's going to take you isn't always going to be nice, rosy, cheeky, lovey, a happy place. Sometimes it's going to be the hard place. But it's in the hard place. It's in the desert. Uh, hey, um, um, Moses, it's in the desert place where you're going to meet God. Sometimes it's not going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be the comfortable place. It's going to be the uncomfortable place. It's where God has a plan waiting for you. If you just get up and move into those places. Because sometimes we want to stay where we're at and expect things to change. See, you have a mind, hopefully, That may guide you in what you do. It may lead you, but it's your heart that affirms your passion to do it. See, within your passion lies a clue to your deeper purpose and ultimately your destiny. I was watching this movie yesterday. It was an older movie. Just I don't know how old it was, but it was a new movie to me. And the main character said these things. He said one thing, and I said, man, I'm going to invite that guy to come preach at my church. He said, every one of us has a why. Anybody know what that movie is? All right, keep your tears off. And he says, we all have a why. What's your why? Why do you get up in the morning? Why do you do what you do? Why? Where's your, what is your why? We all have a why. And, and then he said this. He, it was a three-point message, three-point sermon. 
He said, we have three things in life. And he was talking to this whole group of, of entrepreneurs. And he says, there's three things in life. Three things that motivate human beings. Love. We all want love. We want someone to love us based on what they know about us, not what they don't know about us. We just want to be loved. He said, number two is time. We know we only have a limited amount of time. And we want to get as much done as we can in that minimum time we have. And then the last one, he says, is death. We all fear it, or many fear it. And we know unless Jesus comes back, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. So we live life looking for love in search of some love. Praise God, we have love. His name is Jesus. Amen? And we have time, a limited amount of time, and we're all f heading towards one direction, either the return of Christ or we're going to go to the grave and be resurrected into heaven. And our time on earth is over, is ex extinguished. Nobody likes to talk about that. But it's there. And these things are what motivates us. And, and I don't know about you, but I have love. I can't change time, but I can work with time. And I want to do as much as I can before, I, or before I'm in the ground, amen, or when Jesus comes back. But one thing is for sure, and this is not in the movie, so you can finish the movie now. It's the coming together of events and connections, some that seem random, but it's a result of a divine orchestration to empower you to accomplish what God has placed in you. A destiny is much bigger than you are. To know the plan that God has for you. When I was a young boy, I played football, and I had... My job as a, as a ball player, the first string, was to give the plan. Was to go and play. They play the play, and then I would leave, and I would give the play to, they, the coach would tell me the play, and then I would run onto the field and give the play to the quarterback. While I was out there, another young man would run to the sidelines, and the coach would give him the next play. And then we would just cross back and forth all day long. And I would have the plan. And they couldn't hike that ball. They wouldn't hike that ball. They wouldn't do anything until they heard the play, the plan. Jesus said this. He told his disciples, don't go anywhere until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He's going to give you the plan. Because if without the plan, we just wander. Without the plan, we don't know where we're going. And so these guys are in the huddle, and I'd walk up there, and they'd all look at me. And I was like, ooh, I feel powerful. Because they couldn't do anything without the plan. And so I'd give them the play. Well, one time, I got so excited that I totally forgot the plan. <laughs> and I go to the huddle. <laughs> All right, guys. And they're like, okay, what's the play? And I am searching. I am looking through every crevice of my brain. I'm trying to make up something. I couldn't make it up. And I said, I forgot. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we can't believe you forgot the play. What are we going to do? The clock is ticking. It's time to hike the ball. The guy says, let's just do the last play again. So they did the last play again. The last play that we did only didn't even get us a yard. We actually got knocked back three yards. He goes, let's just do the, the plan we did before. And so we did that one, and we fumbled the ball. And the coach is like, Flores, what are you telling them? And I thought to myself, that's how life is. Because we don't know the plan, we keep doing the same play again and again. We keep getting knocked back, wondering what's going on. I need to know the plan, Lord. I need to know your plan so I can advance. Come on, my friend. It's only halftime. Patriots taught you that. And hopefully you're here at that service when I... Gave you the insight. <laughs> so it's only half time. You wait. Nobody wins in the first half. <laughs> I got to hurry. I'm already out of time. And this is where I really wanted to take you. But I can't. Genesis chapter 1. Let's hurry up. Genesis chapter 1. God created man. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. 
Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's Genesis 1, verse 27 now. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Both male and female, he created them. Then God, everybody say, then God, bless them. You didn't have to say that part. <laughs> and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And I'd like to take each of those words because there's so much insight in those words. The first thing he said to them was, it says, God bless them. See, you're blessed. You were blessed. Yeah, the enemy may have made them fall, but my God says you're blessed. And did you know that God has created the earth? And since the beginning of time, God created the heavens and the earth. In six days, seventh day, he rested. And since then, God has not created, and nothing has ever been created since. There's been plenty of things invented, but nothing's been created. And those that invent things, invent things from the raw resources that are available to them. You see, God has already placed a seed inside of you. And that seed is placed in there, and it's your job to take the resource, the raw material on the inside, so you can bring, bring it out on the outside so that you can do life the way he meant you to do it. The word fruitful, be fruitful, is the word para, which means to increase, to increase. See, it does not say increase if you have the right education. It does not say increase if you have the perfect launch pad. It doesn't say increase if you have the right upbringing. Come on, somebody. It says you have the ability to increase, and God gave you a mind. And that is a great thing. And if you think for a second that the human mind is the steering wheel that determines the directions of one's destiny... then we are transforming our lives by the way we turn our minds, and you limit yourself to operate only in the intellectual and the psycho psychological level and refuse to pay attention to the spiritual inclinations that reside in you. Some will turn their mind to education and other things, but that will leave them lacking. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says multiply, that is the word ravah. Is to be great. You see, perhaps there's millions of people that are sitting on couches saying, I'm gonna. They'll do it with their, when their finances are perfect. They'll go forward when their children are growing up. Well, they'll do it when they, when they reach seniority on the job or some other life marker. They'll never find that in their life because you'll never be perfect. Parts of it will always be times of juggling and adjusting in the areas of your life. You, need to, you and I, we need to get to a point where we step away from the couch sitters who are awaiting the single perfect day to pre begin their living their dream. Because I found out that not every day is going to feel dreamy. Some may feel like a nightmare. But if you get off your good intentions, Your vision for life may never become a reality. I believe that you and I need to have enough faith to believe God and in yourself and know that together the two of you can do anything to increase your capacity to receive more and to do more in that which is destined to be revealed through you. Fill the earth, mala, to accomplish, to be satisfied. I love that because it's an unsatisfied satisfaction that must dwell in each and every one of us. Because if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. You may have to stretch yourself, though. Beyond the circles that surround you. Did you know that you and I are 80%? If we take 10 of your friends, 80% of them are just like you. You are just like 80% of the people that you are surrounded by. Take 10 of your closest friends, 10, and it's almost guaranteed that you are like 80% of them. 
Eight of them are just like you, live in the same house, make the same income, do the, pretty much the same kind of job. And I want to encourage you that it's time for us to step out of that comfort zone. You know, Heather and I, we wanted to do more in life, but we were surrounded by people that really didn't have much going. None of them went to school. And these were even people in church. Don't get me wrong. They didn't ever, no one owned a house. They rented houses. There's nothing wrong with renting houses. Paul rented a house. I understand that. But because none of them owned a house, none of them had careers, none of them had good jobs, it was interesting that we walked in the same realm. And it wasn't until we began to surround ourselves with people of influence, surrounding ourselves with people that have, have accomplished, even bought, bought homes and owned businesses and stuff like that. When we began to do that, it began to pull that out of us. We began to be influenced by those. Because nothing outside of you, one person said it like this, nothing outside of you can make you who you are. It's already in you. God has already implanted in you the raw material needed to shape your destiny into reality. It's, they said it like this. You, are already, you already have what, what's needed to actualize your vision for your life. This is a God-given vision. Otherwise, you would not have it. And we think about life. And sometimes we look at our life and we think, go ahead and turn on the CD. We look at life and we say to ourselves, is there more beyond where I'm at? When Christopher Columbus set sail from Spain in 18, 19, 1492 and stumbled upon Americas, the Spaniards had prided themselves on their misinformed belief that their country was the last westward point of a solid land on a flat earth. The early Spanish coins were inscribed with the words, Ne plus ultra which in Latin, it's a Latin phrase meaning no more beyond. They believed that there was nowhere else they could go after Spain. And if one ventured into the endless sea, only certain danger would lay ahead. And I believe sometimes that, that ne plus ultra is stamped in the minds of so many people that are afraid to go a little bit further, afraid to go beyond their living place, their, 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 where they're living right now, afraid to go a little further because they're afraid of failure, they're afraid of making a mistake, they're afraid of blowing it. Let me tell you something, my friend. I had a young lady come up to me. She began to tell me about her life, and she said, oh, pastor, pray for me. Pastor, pray for me. I've made mistakes in my life. I've done a lot of things that I shouldn't have done, and now I'm where I'm at today. And I just need prayer because I feel so bad. And, 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 and by the unction of the Holy Spirit, and I said, oh, she's not going to want to hear what God just told me to tell her. I said, oh, Lord, let this cup pass from me. <laughs> but not my will, your will be done. <laughs> and I looked right at her as clear as day and, as, as, as humbly as I can and as softly as I can, could. And I looked right at her and I said, you need to stop feeling sorry for yourself. So you've made mistakes. So you've blown it. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Get up and move forward. That's all that is. It's just feeling sorry for, oh, I messed up. Oh, I can't do anything. Oh, that's just a lie from the pit of hell. That's the enemy telling you you can't do it because of your blowing it, because of your mistakes, because of your bad investments. So what? Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Get up and move forward. Come on, my friend. God has forgiven you. God is not going to forsake you. Amen. And anyone that tries to stop you from being more than who you are usually only do it because of selfish reasons, because they're afraid that you'll get to a point where you don't have enough room for them in your life anymore. Joseph had a dream and he wouldn't let anyone hold him down because you can't keep a good man down. To subdue is to make a subservient under you. To have dominion. 
You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, and that's a power that can transform your life, and God's going to empower you. It's a power to change a fisherman. It was a power that changed a tax collector. It was a power of influence and favor and being able to influence and make a difference. It was a power that transformed Peter. It was a power that transformed a woman at the well. It's a power to get the job done. It's a power to move mountains. It's a power to defeat the enemy, and I'm here to let you know that he's given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy let me share something with you before I finish if I may is when Adam and Eve were given this authority they gave it up when they fell into temptation but oh my Lord Jesus came on a cross he died on that cross and he pulled those keys from the hell death and the grave and he walked back to mankind and he says here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on I restore it back to you you have authority and the resources of this planet are available to my children. Come on, Flo, and if you got something from Jesus, let's give him a praise today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo, I tell you what. Amen. Come on, somebody. Let's give Jesus another praise. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's all stand together. Let me pray a blessing over you. Woo, I preach myself happy. Woo. Yeah. Come out tonight, 530. We're going to have a great time. Someone came up to me and said, Pastor, I don't have enough gas. And sleep at the church. I know in the 80s, we used to call it all day for Jesus. Come on. Let's get out. Jump in it, man. You have some, you have some uh, plans you've already made. You know, cancel those plans. Seek first the kingdom. And all those things will be added unto you. Tonight is your night. Tonight is your night. It's an appointment, a divine appointment. God specifically put it on my heart to have a supernatural night so that God can speak to you. And I promise you, you're going to be so pumped and excited and powered up. You are a million times bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. Amen? So come on out at 430. We have prayer. 4.30 to 5.30 is prayer, and at 5.30, we're going to have a dynamic message, service, full worship, children's ministry. It's going to be awesome. I want to encourage you to be here. Amen? Father, I thank you for the saints of God. I thank you that they are blessed coming, and they are blessed going, and in everything they put their hands to, they shall prosper. And with a great Thank you for joining us here at The Rock Church. We would like to extend an invitation for you to come visit one of our live services here at our location. We are located at 4027 Trail Creek Road, Riverside, California, 92505. For more information regarding our service time as well as how you can support the Rock Church Riverside, please visit our website at www.rockchurchsr.com. God bless you, and remember, with God, all things are possible.